um, make a slight uh, uh, change to the schedule, just for the purposes of um, uh, of uh, transportation from the meeting and so forth. We're going to actually uh, move um, uh, Dr. Lamana's talk to after the break, and we'll move um, Aaron Strew's talk uh, to uh, just now before the break. Uh, so, uh, with that, it's it, it, it really is my pleasure to uh, to introduce Aaron Strew. Aaron um, is uh, is the clinical nurse specialist who uh, works uh, in the leukemia clinic in Winnipeg with Dr. Johnston and, and, uh, and Gibson. And um, as you heard yesterday, uh, they have uh, um, um, a, a, a very well-organized uh, model for providing care uh, in Winnipeg. And um, knowing uh, uh, how well um, uh, our programs uh, have, um, have developed with our own uh, nurse specialists. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that Erin is probably the integral part of that clinic functioning. Uh, she's uh, very uh, involved in CLL um, clinical care. She's also very involved in CLL-related um, research with the group, uh, is well-published. Uh, and um, has been uh, in particular interested in aspects related to uh, second malignancy uh, and, and, and as well general aspects of CLL-related care. So I think um, uh, she's really going to be able to offer a unique perspective and uh, is going to talk about this very important issue, as you heard uh, a little bit about yesterday, of second malignancies, but also provide some uh, background about this um, uh, uh, new um, product of subcutaneous uh, immunoglobulin and the potential benefits that they've seen in their uh, clinic. So we're uh, really excited to have her here. So um, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me uh, to come and speak today. It's incredibly humbling um, and an honor to come and speak to such a large group of patients. Um, I have to, to tell you, I started out just as all of you did. Uh, Twelve years ago, I came over from a hospital ward to work with Dr. Johnston at Cancer Care Manitoba in the leukemia clinic, and it was a toss-up. I was offered um, Dr. Johnston's CLL lymphoma or G, um, radiation oncology. I wanted to work in GI, um, so I thought I would choose to work with Dr. Johnston. It took 10 years for me to tell him that um, the very first day in clinic, the nurse who was doing my orientation, I asked her if these lymphocytes were something important and if it was something that I should be documenting. So I started out just like you. I knew nothing about leukemia. I knew nothing about CLL. Um, and it's been a long journey. And um, just like our Winnipeg Jets, uh, our clinic is really fueled by passion. So I'm just going to share a little bit of uh, the work that we've been doing um, around second malignancies and also around subcutaneous immunoglobulins. So a lot of the work that I do with this is often um, taking the information that our uh, basic science and our, our clinic is learning from um, our work and from the literature and trying to find a way to bridge it back to patients. So to, to explain it back to patients, to educate patients, because that's what the role of nurses is to do, is to do health promotion, illness prevention, and education. And so this morning you had a talk about math, and now I'm going to actually talk to you about your homework assignments. Because we have a great awareness as healthcare providers that because you have CLL, you have an increased risk of second malignancies. And I think that it's been clear over the last day and a half that it's been sort of woven through all of the, the talks. So um, I was very proud to say that I had no curves in uh, my talk, but there is one um, set of curves that I will show you um, when I get to the sub-Q piece. So the object objectives for today are to just to review a little bit of the current evidence again um, on second cancers in CLL, to review some current cancer screening guidelines, to discuss prevention and early detection strategies, ways that you can reduce your cancer risk, and then just um, briefly, I also want to talk to you about our sub-QIG program. So what is the evidence on CLL? and second cancers. It's no surprise to you that you all know that you have a, an increased risk of getting a second cancer. And that's just by virtue of having CLL. 
So we know, um, I'm not telling you anything already that you don't know, but you know that your risk is higher because you have an immune suppressed state because of your underlying CLL. We know that pre previous treatments that you might get or tr treatments that you may get in the future may also increase your risk. We know that um, just by virtue of getting cancer, you, you have a predisposition to getting cancer, and so that risk is inherent in your cells, and that risk stays with you. We know that um, when you have CLL, your environment of your body and your, your, your makeup is different, and so your cells and cancer cells may actually be more likely to undergo metastatic disease um, or local invasion in, in your body, whereas if a healthy individual just got that cancer on their own, um, and it might not be a characteristic of that cancer, such as a, a basal cell or a squamous cell carcinoma, which are skin cancers, um, that that might actually occur in, in those cancers in your body. And we also know, um, or we think, that second cancers might be reported because we're actually looking for them. And so now that we sort of are aware, we might be reporting them more, and that's why the, the numbers may be a little bit higher. But we did some work um, in Winnipeg looking at a comparison, not with healthy um, patients, but with patients who have another slow-growing lymphoma, follicular lymphoma. And we found that even when we compared CLL patients with follicular lymphoma patients, that that risk was still higher. Um, and so we know that it's not just a surveillance bias. So overall, your risk of getting a second cancer is about um, twofold. We know that skin cancers in particular are the most important um, second cancers that you're most likely to get. And that's what you need to walk home with today, that your risk of getting a skin cancer is higher because you have CLL. In particular, the non-melanoma skin cancers, which are your uh, squamous cell carcinomas, your basal cell carcinomas, those are higher. Um, those are the, the highest ones that we see. And we know that men get those more often than women. And so why might that be? Well, um, because as a good wife, we send our husbands out to mow the lawn. Um, so they're outside more. I mean, we garden, so th that sort of levels the playing field. Um, but men are farmers, uh, they do more outside work. Um, and Dr. Johnson talked yesterday about wearing a hat. So uh, lots of men and young, young men in particular wear baseball hats. Uh, well, that really doesn't cover the back of your neck and it doesn't cover your ears. And so, um, so that's not necessarily um, protective for you. We know, um, because the literature says, and in our clinic, lots of our patients say, because Dr. Johnston says, um, that men and women have, of all ages have an equal risk. So um, we don't necessarily want to pick out uh, one patient versus another. All of you in this room should take away the message that your risk of getting a second cancer is higher. And as Dr. Keating said yesterday, 45% of deaths of CLL are associated um, with the second malignancy. And so the three things that, that patients who are diagnosed with CLL that they die from are infectious complications, progression of their disease, and second malignancies. Second malignancies is something that you have the ability and the, the power to control um, the outcome. And so that's where your homework comes from. We know that there's no impact from the time from diagnosis. The work that we did in Winnipeg um, with our population study and our CLL group showed that the average time from to diagnosis to the second cancer was about 3.1 years, but it can happen as quickly as six months to um, up to 11 years. And so what that really tells us is that you should always be vigilant, that you, you should never sort of let your guard down. It's not something that as soon as you get diagnosed, you should be very aware of, and then as time passes, Passes, you should let your guard down. It's a risk that doesn't go away, and so you must always, always continue to um, be vigilant and to continue to practice your screening guidelines. Second cancers um, can negatively impact your overall survival. So there are some cancers in particular, lung, breast, and colorectal, that if you are diagnosed with those second cancers after your CLL diagnosis, they're more aggressive in nature, and you're more likely to require treatment and have your overall life um, survival affected by those diagnoses. And so um, whatever you can do to, to change the course of um, a potential cancer is very important. 
So the common second cancer is, skin cancer is bolded because it is the most important one that I want you to walk away from. Um, but as you see, really, all of the skin, um, sorry, all of the cancers really, um, you, you have a, a potential to get um, or to be diagnosed with. As I said, lung, breast, and colorectal um, are more aggressive, and you have the, they have the potential to impact negatively your overall survival. Um, our speakers yesterday talked already about your increased risk of AML, uh, myelodysplastic synd syndrome from previous treatments. Um, the incidence of Richter's transformations has already been discussed. Uh, but those are still um, uh, other cancers that you're at risk for. So skin cancers and CLL. Basal cell carcinoma um, is usually a very easily curable um, cancer. And squamous cell carcinoma is usually a very slow-growing cancer. Those two um, statements do not necessarily hold true when you have CLL. So what's important to remember, and it's what our dermatologist tells everybody, is that the biggest organ in your body is your skin. So if you think about the chances of getting a second cancer somewhere, well, probably on the biggest organ that you have, which is your skin. But the most important piece that she always tells patients is, is it is preventable. So this is where you can take control and you can actually intervene and where your actions actually can improve your outcomes. There is an eight-fold increase of developing skin cancer. Um, it's more likely uh, that you may experience metastatic um, disease uh, for skin cancers than if you didn't have CLL. It's more likely that these skin cancers may recur. Um, and so as clinicians, we have a very uh, low threshold for suspicion. Anything that looks suspicious, um, we usually either biopsy in the cutaneous lymphoma clinic or uh, we send off to Dr. Wiseman to do biopsies. As a nurse, um, there's studies out there that say that something like skin checks and skin screening is something that you can teach a nurse and healthcare providers, um, frontline healthcare staff to do, and to do well. And so I am not an expert in skin cancer, but I am an expert in looking at things that I think looks kind of strange. So I will often say to Dr. Johnston, you know, when you go in the room, can you just take a look at, um, you know, sometimes I'll even say, can you look at the, the tip of, of the wife's nose? Because she has something there, it just, it wasn't there the last time I saw them, and can you just take a peek? And so um, we're overly cautious, um, but we're overly cautious for a reason, and it's for your benefit. So, um, we looked at, and, and some of the data was presented yesterday, we looked at a cohort of 612 patients, um, I think between 2007 and 2011, and it, we compared them with another group of patients with a slow-growing indolent lymphoma, follicular lymphoma, and we found that patients with CLL had a 1.8-fold increase in getting second cancers. So a lot of the other studies out there um, looked at comparing CLL patients with the general population. And our study is different. Um, and I think better, because we actually compared with another lymphoma. Um, and so instead of comparing an apple to a truck, we tried to compare an apple to an orange, and so, or two kinds of apples, um, so to speak. So we tried to make the comparison groups a little bit closer to make the, the outcome um, more significant. We found that cancer was the leading cause of death in those patients. About a quarter of them reported having a previous cancer. And about a quarter of the remaining actually developed a second cancer after their diagnosis. And importantly, it was a 15-fold increase of, of developing skin cancer. So what's it's really powerful for us, because often when patients come in, they say, what can I do? How does this impact me? This is actually information that is based in Canada, in our patient population, that we can actually say to them, this is what... Um, your future may hold, and now we're going to actually um, inform you and educate you and, and, and arm you with um, sort of some weapons to combat this. These were the most common second cancers, again, non-melanoma skin cancers, your digestive organs, and then sort of the, um, the most common, the prostate, the breast, and the lung. So there has been some work that looked at uh, the clinical features associated with an increased risk. And as a nurse, what I use this information for is those people who, um, it, uh, while we counsel everybody, people who um, we might actually spend a little bit more time with um, trying to reinforce um, our message. So if you're of an older age, um, unfortunately if you're of a male gender, 
If you have an elevated beta-2 microglobulin, an elevated LDH, an elevated serum creatinine, um, those actually increase your risk. And if you look at things like um, beta-2 microglobulin and serum creatinine, that actually goes back to uh, what we were talking about yesterday about fitness. And so if um, you have diabetes, if you're obese, um, if you have to take uh, high cholesterol medications, then your overall body is at risk um, just based on your composition and your current status of developing, of being at risk for a potential cancer. There's been some new work coming out of Spain that's looking at is there a genetic link, and this is um, the only study that I found, but uh, looking at uh, if you have either a deletion 13 or the presence of at least two abnormalities, they found that in a group of 108 patients that 8% of those patients actually had a second cancer. So whether or not um, this is meaningful right now, I, I think because we have an awareness of second cancers, we're going to start to see a lot more um, data coming um, in the literature. So cancer screening. Um, this is from the American Cancer Society, and um, as you can see, the lion needs courage, the uh, tin man needs a heart, uh, the scarecrow needs a brain, and that poor wicked witch, she's um, elderly and over 50, and she needs a colorectal exam. And so that holds true for all of you out there in the audience. Um, in Manitoba, when you turn 50, um, in addition to getting a lovely birthday card from your great aunt Dot, uh, you also get an invitation from the government, if you're a lady, to go for a mammogram. And you um, also get an invitation to go for a colonoscopy. And what strikes me about uh, those invitations are that the onus is completely put, put back on you as individuals and as patients to participate. And so um, this is... We, it's an invitation, but I would hope that all of you can now see it as a gift, as a gift of a reminder, as a gift um, to save your life. So it is not pleasant to have any of your body parts um, squeezed or probed, um, but please, uh, for, for the sake of your health and, and for your loved ones, please, um, please engage in screening practices. So a screening test identifies patients who are asymptomatic in a healthy population that be, may be at risk for a disease. And the goal is um, purely cancer prevention. It's really important when we're looking at um, sending patients for screening that we aren't over-screening. And so the benefit uh, for screening Really, for a, a screening test to be beneficial, your overall survival has to be about five years. And so when we're recommending that pe patients go for screening tests, um, like, your, uh, like a pap test for women, um, a mammogram, fecal occult blood testing, or a colonoscopy, we always have to, to weigh the risks and the benefits. And if the test itself is actually going to um, put you at greater risk for health um, problems or sort of open up a can of worms that's a cascade of, of new health issues, then we as healthcare providers have to weigh that before um, we go on. Because if you don't have an overall life um, survival of, of five years, then there isn't necessarily a benefit for going for that test. So the Oncology Nursing Society looked at um, who is most likely to get screened. Uh, and so those patients who are most likely to participate in screening are married. So by virtue of just being married, um, you are um, at risk, or, sorry, you're at risk. You're at risk of being nagged. Um, but it's a gift because those are patients who are more likely to go for a colonoscopy or a mammogram. Uh, those patients are, are likely more educated. They likely, um, in, in, and this is likely more in the United States, they're more likely to have insurance. They're likely to have a usual place of care or a clinic, and I think that that lends itself back to uh, what we were talking about yesterday, about how if you go to a specialty clinic, um, you're more likely to have um, better care. And so it's also talking about continuity, because it's somebody that uh, we develop relationships with. And so over 12 years, I, I know who has a family history of colon cancer, I know who has a family history of breast cancer, and I also know to repeatedly ask people um, if they've gone for their screening tests, and I can also anticipate who's going to give me grief about being asked. The number one thing I can say to you is, if you are sitting there and you don't know if you've had a colonoscopy, you have never had a colonoscopy. <laughs> That is not something you will forget. I've never had one, but I will remember the first time. And I think what's really important is 
you are more likely to go and have um, screening practices done if you have been told to do so. And so um, that is what I am doing today. I'm telling you to go and participate in screening practices. So I developed this um, a few years ago just for our patients. And I, what I did is, and what I tell nurses is, screening practices are fabulous because it doesn't matter where you live in Canada, North America, Screening guidelines for your location, um, they are on the World Wide Web, which is fabulous. I'm pretty sure the internet's going to take off. Um, so we all have access to screening guidelines. We all have screening um, practices clinics within our, our region, and it's something that's cheap. We can, we can actually go and educate patients. So this is actually just um, sort of a summary of all the different screening that we talk to and early prevention. So what we haven't talked about already is things like oral health, making sure that you're going to see a dentist, that you're having somebody look in your mouth um, that is, you're not necessarily just a family member, but it's actually a professional looking in your mouth because what you might think is a sore tooth could actually be a head and neck cancer. Um, and we've actually, we actually have had a few of those in clinic. And so it's important that you're going and, and you're seeing your dentist um, and you're, you're looking and getting um, looked in your mouth. If you're a smoker, there's nothing I can say that's going to tell you um, that's going to change your mind about smoking. Most smokers are going to quit when you want to quit, but quitting is going to save your life. So um, what we tell patients is, what I tell patients is, is there's nothing I can tell you that's going to make you quit, but when you are ready, we have resources here, and I would love to sit down and talk to you. I'd love to refer you to our clinic, um, because we're here to help you with that. So cancer, cancer screening programs, this is um, our Get Checked Manitoba for breast, cervix, and colon cancer. The really great thing about screening programs, at least in Manitoba, is you can self-refer. Um, and so if you want to just give them a call or your family doctor wants to give a call, you can actually just, um, you can sort of bypass your specialty clinic. Usually what we do is we sort of talk to patients about maintaining your relationship with your family doctor um, and, and, and then if we can help to, in some way to facilitate these referrals, we also do that. So um, what to report? Screening practices, so you should be aware of when your last colonoscopy was, your mammogram, if you've ever seen a dermatologist and had anything cut off. Um, you should start recording those dates um, and locations of, of you know, where you might have had a biopsy done. And then you need to report them back to your oncologist. You need to report any persistent or worrisome symptoms. Um, and what I usually tell patients is, when in doubt, just ask us. You know, if you, if you want to talk about something, just give us a call. Um, it'll ease your, your fears and your worries. And, and if it's nothing, it's a couple second conversation and it's, yeah, no, nope, you're good. And, you know, I document it and then we just sort of go on. And your cancer clinic or your, your health care provider is probably, you know, there's not a lot of people who want to hear about your poop. They don't want to hear about um, how many times you're going to the washroom. Um, you know, depending on your neighbors and your friends and your families, they don't always want to hear about aches and pains, but we do. Um, and so you should always show us, show us your lesions, show us um, any moles that are changing because we actually want to see them. And um, really just trust yourself. There's a, the Lymphoma um, Canada has the know your nodes. You really should know your body. Um, and if it's something feels wrong, it probably is, um, and you should talk to us about it. So this is information that you should know. Um, and when I talk to nurses and healthcare providers, this is, I change this, to, this is information you should ask. So in our clinic, we talk to you about your family history of cancer, um, any personal history, your cancer screening practices, when your last mammogram, colonoscopy, if you've ever had uh, your prostate checked, um, if you've had your PSA checked, skin checks, pap smears. We talk to you about your current and your past tobacco and alcohol use, and uh, we talk again about keeping your vaccinations up to date. So a little skin cancer 101. Uh, Dr. Johnston um, and I have worked together a long time, so we have the same sort of piece in there. Um, and so that little, that little piggy there um, is, One's a little piggy and one is a little fried piece of bacon. So your basal cell carcinomas, these are your most easily curable. The picture on your, of the ear is actually a gentleman in um, our clinic. Um, and often basal cell carcinomas will have those rolled domed edges. And so that's how you can tell um, that from, a, from another lesion. But cancer, skin cancers, they will 
bleed, they will crust, they will ooze, they won't go away. Um, and so that's what you need to watch for. You don't have to be skin cancer specialist, but you, my three-year-old, uh, I take pictures on my, my phone, my, my three-year-old can zip through my pictures and he can go, that's the cancer, that's the cancer. So you, that's what you need to start learning. What does skin cancer look like? And if you Google basal cell or skin cancer, you can actually start to see what those lesions look like. Squamous cell carcinoma um, is the second most frequent uh, skin cancer. Uh, the picture on the bottom is actually another patient in our clinic, um, and that started out just as a small little um, spot, probably half the size of your pinky nail, um, and he ended up having to have radiation to it. Your melanoma, those are your dark um, brown or black lesions. Your increase um, uh, of death with melanoma when you have CLL is about five times higher than if you don't have CLL. Um, and when you are in an immune suppressed state, the control of melanoma is actually, it's much harder to control um, and it's more likely to spread. So there's the ABCDE guide and F and G now um, for skin cancers, and this is also something that you can Google. So if you have a spot on your skin that you're not really sure about, um, these are sort of the things that we look at. So asymmetry, the borders of those lesions, the color, is it changing, um, the diameter, is it growing, is it evolving, is it firm to the touch, um, and, and G again for is it growing. So that's something that if you're not um, sure about skin cancers, you can actually do a little research before you call. So in Winnipeg, we have a, a program called Kick Cancer, and it's to target um, the ability to reduce your risk of cancer by following um, five sort of lifestyle choices. And these are all modifiable um, lifestyle choices um, that can reduce your risk of cancer. So they're actually very simple. So be smoke-free, eat well, um, that's including fruits and vegetables into your diet. It helps to decrease your risks of head and neck cancers, stomach cancers. Shape up. You need to get up and you need to get moving. And I was in the elevator with somebody yesterday who says he walks 10 miles a day. I'm not, or I'm not sure where you are. And so he was going out to walk, which is wonderful. Um, we don't all have to be Lance Armstrong because we all know that that didn't end well. But we all need... <laughs> to get up and get moving. You need to get up, you know, pets are wonderful because dogs, they don't care if it's snowing, they don't care if you're tired, they want to get out and they want to get walked. So just, if you're not, if you're sedentary, get out and get moving. Um, we can all afford to lose a little bit of weight um, unless you're sort of in active disease and then your, your body's doing that for you, unfortunately. But if you're sort of in this healthy remission state, watch and wait, that is something that you can do. You can help to lose weight to actually present to your oncologist the very best version of you to undergo treatment. So increasing your fitness level to maybe potentially give you more treatment options if and when you do need treatment. Uh, cover up it looks, is looking at skin cancer and um, uh, healthy sun hygiene, and then getting checked. So skin and sun hygiene. Um, all patients within six months of getting diagnosed with CLL, you should be going to see a dermatologist and having a, a full head-to-toe skin check. You should avoid the sun whenever possible. You should be putting on lots and lots of sunscreen. Uh, you should be wearing very wide-brimmed hats. You should be covering your ears with either sunscreen um, or a, like a, a floppy hat. Um, you should be covering, uh, putting SPS, SPF lip balm on your lips. Don't forget about your lips because often that's, um, you, you can get skin cancers on your lips. Um, and the other thing is that when we cover up our skin with sunscreen, we're preventing our body from synthesizing vitamin D, and so you should all be taking your supplements. So this take-home summary is that we're all um, in the room, not all, but those of you with CLL, um, have a, a two-fold increase of getting a second cancer and because of your CLL. The most common is your skin cancer. It's preventable. Um, men and women of all ages are at equal risk, so I'm talking to all of you. If your spouse is out there, all of these ideas about reducing your risk of cancer, they apply to you. And this is the one time that I'm going to say, please pester your spouse about undergoing their screening. So do things as a team. When you um, do things as a team, like in exercising, when you're accountable to somebody else, you're more likely to carry on that habit and make it a long-term habit. And um, 
So participate in your cancer screening, stay well informed, be knowledgeable. When you're sitting out in the waiting room, which in some clinics can be a long time, talk to other patients that are sitting out there. Really sort of spread the word and be your own advocate. Sorry, how much time do I have? About five minutes? Yeah. So, okay. So for the last um, couple of minutes, I'm just going to talk to you about our subcutaneous immunoglobulin home infusion program that we started uh, last fall in Winnipeg. So we've already talked about um, hypogamma globulinemia in, in previous talks, um, and we know that about a quarter of patients have low levels at your diagnosis. And as you live longer with uh, CLL and you um, are exposed to treatments, your levels are going to go down. So if your IgG is less than normal, and um, our normal ranges are 6 to 15, or 6.9 to, to 15, um, I have two sort of subsets. At less than 6, what um, I sort of get a little bit excited, and then I start to really, uh, what we're trying to do is to tell patients that their levels are getting low, and then sort of educate them that if you're having problems with recurrent fevers, infections, you're needing antibiotics, if you get hospitalized in your local community, you need to let us know that. Because patients may be only seeing us every six to 12 months, and you know, two months after seeing us, you might be hospitalized and not be coming back for 10 months to see us. So when your levels start to fall less, less than the normal range, we're, we're notifying patients and we're educating them. And then at less than three grams per liter, that's when we're actually intervening. So as I said, if you have persistent recurrent infectious complications requiring frequent courses of antibiotics, that's something that we want to know about. And so our standard of care was IVIG every four weeks at 0.4 milligrams per kilo, um, or in some instances we were just giving 10 grams as a flat dose um, based on the literature. And then we sort of heard about um, the other sort of immune deficient patients, the patients who are primary immune deficient. And so they're born with low levels of IgG or no um, IgGs, not secondary to a cancer, but as their primary issue. And so uh, that patient population has been using subcutaneous uh, for far longer than, than we have. It's very novel and new in the oncology setting. And so I, I actually found out that our Health Sciences Center had a program uh, it, that had started six years ago. And so I thought, well, we'll just refer everybody out. But the reality was is that they couldn't actually take on the burden of all of our referrals. And so I got the idea that we should actually be monitoring you within the cancer center because then we can be keep better track of your IgG levels, we can correlate that with your CLL, we can monitor your infections, your antibiotics, and it's just keeping everything in-house. So um, with the financial support of CSL Bearing, who um, is the maker of Hyzentra, which is the product that we do use, um, we were able to start a program last fall. And uh, it's a pilot program for a year. And to date, um, we've roll enrolled 22 patients. Um, and we have nine pending. It's, it's actually been overwhelming the, um, the response. The average age of the patients is about 69 years. Um, the oldest is 91. We actually have set her up with home care, um, but I, 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 I would actually wager that if I needed to teach Sophie, she could probably do it on her own. Um, it's incredibly well tolerated, and in particular, um, so I, I went to her home to do hers uh, for hers uh, once or twice, and she gave me a little tour of her um, apartment, and she has a treadmill. She's 91 years old. She has a treadmill beside her bed um, that she uses every day, and after I finished her infusion, she said, you know, do I have to do anything? And I said, well, how do you feel? And she says, I feel great. And I said, no, you're good. And she says, can I get on my treadmill this afternoon? And I said, have at it. So, so it's incredibly well tolerated. Um, and what we're looking at is optimal dosing. So do we actually have to use the same doses that we use with intravenous? We're looking at infection rates, antibiotic use. We're also looking at quality of life data, treatment satisfaction. Um, and in particular, because in the primary immune deficient patient population, um, patients actually report higher quality of life scores and greater treatment satisfaction with one, being able to infuse at home, and two, being able to self-infuse. So gaining that control and the freedom of deciding when they, get, when they want to infuse. If patients want to infuse at 11 o'clock at night, you can do that. Um, you're not bound by the hours of the cancer center. You're saving um, transport time, parking, which is an issue in Winnipeg. Um, and, and usually the time of the infusion is shorter than it would take to get ready, get in your car, and probably drive half the way to the cancer center. 
So we're looking at treatment satisfaction. I'm looking at some cost analysis and resource savings, in particular uh, chair time, because now we're freeing up chair time for chemotherapy patients, um, and nursing hours are being saved. Um, so we're looking at that. And then we're also going to correlate that back with uh, the patients who are using um, immunoglobulins and your CLL ca um, characteristics. So the benefits, you don't need venous access, takes less time, um, it saves us resources. It allows you greater independence and freedom. Um, there's more satisfaction, there's fewer costs associated to you. Um, for patients who are still working, um, you don't have to take that time off from work because in our center at least, blood products can only be given Monday to Friday, eight to four, which is the same as most jobs. Um, and so you don't have to take time off from work to go get your treatments. It also um, provides a more stable immunoglobulin level. So you, you have fewer peaks and troughs um, when you're giving it in the fat tissue than when you're giving it um, in the intravenous. And there's fewer side effects. So these are just some of the infusion sites. Uh, most of our patients either use the abdomen where we um, all have a little bit of extra uh, fat tissue or in our thighs, um, which uh, women have more on their upper outer thigh. We have more fat tissue there. Um, and uh, we all have fat on the inside of our thigh, which is somewhere else where you can infuse. This is really all that it looks like to do um, um, the products and the supplies uh, for one infusion. So uh, we give patients a mat that actually has um, the process in pictures and in words to walk them through it. Patients usually tell me it takes them about a month to master everything and then they, everything is just sort of tickety-boo, second nature, which is in keeping with that sort of that thought that it takes about 21 days to, to create a habit. Here are the curves that I told you about and I, I wasn't going to put the picture of my husband's abdomen in, but um, there it is. I put it in last night. Uh, he wouldn't let me poke him with the needle, so I just um, put the needle to his abdomen, taped it down there, and then he's just infusing. Um, and it's one ml per minute when you're doing your infusion, so if it's 15 mls, it takes you about 15 minutes. Um, and there's the other curve. That's um, just to show you how fanatical we are in Winnipeg. Um, about our jets. My husband did not want to wear a white tuxedo like his friend to the whiteout. He wanted to wear a white unitard. <laughs> Thankfully, he put a jersey over top of it because I think he would have been arrested. This is what uh, the site reaction, and this is the most common um, reaction or side effect that patients experience. And this is literally right as the needle came out. I took a picture. Um, you can see there's just a little bit of raised area which um, is absorbed and goes away after um, anywhere from a few hours till the next day. Um, and that uh, little bit of pink that you see is that's just a normal sort of um, colored, uh, discoloration that you would see. Oh, and so that's it. If there's any questions, if there's time for questions. So that was just a fantastic talk. Uh, some very, very uh, important uh, messages there. And um, we do have uh, a few minutes for some questions. So um, um, go ahead. Hi, I enjoyed your talk very much. And I was wondering if the data that you're getting on secondary um, primary cancers is broken down so that there's de novo prior to treatment and uh, the data of cancers after treatment and the effects of, of uh, CT or PET scan radiation in relationship to these cancers. Uh, uh, I'm, I was aware of a study which isn't perfect for the CLL community, but it was uh, the, a Taiwanese nationwide study showing uh, in increased uh, secondary primary cancers among patients who had uh, therapy with intent to cure, and they noticed a divergence within two years of increased uh, secondary primary cancers with people that had eight uh, or more CT scans. I, I wasn't laughing at you, I was laughing because I haven't read the Taiwanese um, article. Um, but I think as healthcare, pro I, I don't know of um, any studies off the top of my head that's looking at that, but I think as, as healthcare providers, we have an awareness that, um, that, that the radiation from CTs and PET scans um, can be harmful. And so 
there's a movement towards doing far fewer CAT scans um, and PET scans. And so uh, PET scans actually offer less radiation than, than a CAT scan, um, but we're actually sort of really mindful as healthcare providers of, of exposing you to radiation because we understand those risks now. Is that all? My question is really simple. Um, as a newly diagnosed CLL, I have asked my caregiver and my dentist, should I be taking an antibiotic before any dental work? They so, didn't know the answer. <laughs> so what we usually, um, the message that we usually tell patients is, if you're immune suppressed, so if your neutrophil count is low, um, it's probably not a great time to be going to see your dentist to, getting, to get any invasive dental work done. Um, that said, what we usually do is, and it's not great in your uh, instance, is we usually put the onus back on, um, on the dentist. And so we wouldn't routinely, unless you're neutropenic, um, it's not the practice to prescribe antibiotics. But if it is an instance where your dentist would normally give you antibiotics, then you should follow through with that, unless there's, you know, some reason um, that there's, it's going to interfere with your treatment or if there's an interaction with your antibiotic. And so that's usually the message that we tell patients. Um, just let your doctor know if you're on treatment, if you're, um, if you're on any supportive medications. But if he or she were to prescribe you uh, antibiotics for that dental procedure or intervention, then you should follow through with that. Hi. Um, what is the dose per mil of have a pump that it, you use for? So it's a 20% concentration. So one gram is five milliliters. So depending on what your dose is, um, if you were getting 10 grams, which is the, sort of the flat dose, we actually just uh, load you, um, round it up to 12 grams. And then we divide that dose into four, so that's your monthly dose, 12 grams, divided by four weeks. So you would get three grams a week, and then times five milliliters, it's math again. It's confusing, but once you get onto it, it's easy. So it's three grams times five mLs, which is 15 mLs. So that's how long it would take. There are pumps that are available, um, but you still have to draw up the product into the syringe. And so my thinking is, and it's a smaller volume than they need in the primary immune deficiency population. And so because our volumes are smaller, 15 mLs is only going to take you 15 minutes to infuse. My thinking is, is that if you had to draw up the medication, which is more difficult than pushing it, if you can draw it up, you can push it. Um, there are pumps that are available, um, and there's a Hyzentric care program throughout uh, different regions in Canada that can actually help to set you up with those and help um, with cost. Our program is set up so that, um, because it's often a fear. As soon as anything goes from intravenous to pill or hospital to home, the costs then get shifted to patients. And we've actually set up our program so that there's absolutely no cost incurred to patients to be on the program or for supplies. Um, but there is a pump that is available. We've just opted not to use it. <laughs> 